totally live. Like, this is actually happening right now. I am totally speaking into this microphone. Thanks, of course, Jeff, for sponsoring us. Go check out the video with all their stuff. They got a new keyboard with new switches that are exclusive to Cherry MX. They also have a mouse that's old, but they've updated it with the brand new awesome Pixar 3360X. 60X, they said, because I don't know if they can use 66. 3366, I said it. And uh, they've also got some really cool Lewis drifting going on with the game that we checked out. So check out that video or else. Thank you very much, Corsair. No, hey, that's, that's that. Anyway, so yeah, here yeah. at PAX, um, we run around mostly the indie booths. We haven't really checked out a lot of hardware. I mean, we did check out some Logitech. They got a really nifty keyboard wall, which basically is just a wall of keyboards with all of the keycaps taken off because they're using it as a giant LED screen, which I thought was pretty awesome because you can do that. And wow, someone's Liz, making a lot of really obnoxious noise. Hey, yeah. Well, you're supposed to do this kind of thing, right? I'm just disturbed by what I saw. I call that the mashed sweet potato. I'm heavily disturbed right now. Let's talk about some indie uh, something games. Something just caught fire over there. Someone caught fire? Whoa. Oh, that's League of Legends. They're always oh, there. never mind. I haven't actually seen it. I didn't even know they were here. <laughs> of course they're here. It's League of Legends. Of course they're here. They're everywhere. Look, right behind you go some League of Legends cosplayers. Show, show. Cosplayers, League of Legends. They're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. You can't even, you, if you mention it, another one will walk by. So, all right, let's pick right. a few indie games that we want people to check out. You guys check out all of our videos. We've been checking out. Checking out, check out, check out, check out, check out. We've been checking out. You check We've out been looking games? at a lot of games. I have been investigating and... Um, Playing with out. different games. I'm going to say anything other right, than checking one. out. Pick one. Anyway, so uh, let's see. Uh, go ahead. What's the first game you want to talk about? Real let's quick. talk about uh, Kona. Now, when I first came up to this game, I was like, what is this? I thought it was an Unreal Engine 4 game. It's actually a Unity game. It's probably the best looking Unity game uh, in development that I've seen. It takes place in a frozen, frosty environment over the period of a day. Uh, there's some narrative that I'm not going to really get into and give away. Um, there are survival elements, but there's also a goal. So if you want to just play it straight up survival, they say you can play for up to 30 hours and try to survive in this harsh environment. But I like the fact that there is a plot with a goal. You're out trying to find maybe somebody or something. And uh, you're also up against the elements. There's going to be some wolves, uh, you know, and when the sun goes down, you're going to be battling wolves. And then you need to start a fire or whatever else. But for me, a lot of times I feel like I get lost in the survival games. I love survival elements, but without a, a, a you know maybe a, a bigger theme or a bigger hook for me. Like you know, hey, you're in the elements and you better do this. You better go do this. There's, there's a plot thing, you know, instead of just being there. I think this will actually hold my attention, and it's beautiful. And some of the effects that they were using, like when they blow up, uh, they use some dynamite in a in an ice cave, and just the effect of the the you know the particles of ice and everything flying back filling up the cave is something that I've usually only expected to see in movies so really looking forward to that game and uh, you guys should go check out our interview on that one for sure all right what do you what do you got um I don't know I'm just gonna name off the ones I I, I went I like want to mention uh Into the Stars it's basically uh FTL meets Omega meets uh No Man's Sky on crack I mean it's it's more like FTL and the type of gameplay it is but it looks like something you'd see in, in No Man's Sky or Star Citizen or, or one of these other uh, first-person space adventures. But it's it's more like FTL with a lot of the like resource-gathering elements of like Omega, which I thought was pretty interesting. And then we've got, uh, what was the other one I wanted to mention? Uh, Pyre was really neat. There's a big interview we got on that one, so just check that one out. I'm not even going to go any further than that. It was mind-bogglingly amazing. Give me a little bit more just so I can put some B-roll on it. No, no, no. That's it. This is the B-roll right here. That game confused the, okay, that game confused the fuck out of me. You you have to be, you have to be listening to it. And you have to be in playing it. It's 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 like what did you say? It was like space, uh, space like soccer? like arcane soccer or something. It was a very like strange space, game. Arcane soccer. I don't know anything. There there's, a, there's the dynamic of the the battle system was really strange, and you have to play it to really get the handle on it. Oh, you were running around banishing people at the same time you were throwing an orb around, and it looked like you were trying to get it to their pyre, which it was it really looked like some kind of ethereal. Ar arcane soccer. It was weird. Yeah, was that's like, kind of what it is. With a story. And, and there, yeah, it's 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 made by Supergiant Games. It's the same guys who made Bastion, Bastion. and uh, Transistor. So it's got that same. Uh, the, the music was by the art same style guy. Is unbelievable. Same kind of art style, um, except they've they've kind of evolved a bit. Anyway, it's it's a great. It's something I definitely want to say uh, everyone should check out. And uh, we we I can't wait. It's going to come out sometime next year. It's not this year, but next year, which sucks, but soon. All right. All so. Right. 
Torm Banner Studios. We checked out a game called Mirage. And then also, you know, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of these have the same sort of color palette. Have you noticed like a lot of the games have like this sort of fuchsia pink and maybe soft blues and that sort of thing? There's this like, I don't know, very pastel color palette and almost cartoony but slightly tough and realistic. I, I noticed that with a lot of the games. And this game kind of had it too. These are, these are the guys who made Chivalry. And so seeing that art style from them was like, oh, they're not going for the uber realism. And it's also a game about magic. But shares a lot of similarities to um, chivalry. So, you know, you can still run up to people and, and melee them and lob off heads and chop off arms and all that sort of thing. But the focus on this game is magic. And you have more classes out of the beginning. Uh, I think they had seven or eight different classes. I forget how many exactly there were. But um, you're going to be able to throw fireballs and stuff. And compare that to like chivalry where, you know, the, the melee is a spear or a bow and arrow that's kind of slow to load. Um, and, and, you know, like it has a very difficult arc. This one's, it's going to speed up the gameplay a little bit. Characters still move slow, but here's the other interesting catch. You can block any of the, um, uh, you know, any of the ranged attacks. So if someone's casting a fireball, you'll be able to block it. Only if, you know, a few times, if someone gets you in the corner and keeps throwing fireballs at you, their mana is going to go down, but so is your shield. So that could be interesting. It may be a strategy to get someone in the corner and just pummel them with a few fireballs, then pull out your melee and just go over and hack them after their shield is down. I don't know. Could be, could be an interesting... Um, Dynamic, and I'm looking forward to that because, uh, yeah, I, I like Chivalry. I think it was a necessary game, but that with a little bit of uh, melee and plus Unreal Engine 4 for better visuals and control could be quite a bit of fun. So that's another one of my picks. I uh, I got to check out uh, Frozen Synapse 2, which is basically Frozen Synapse zoomed way out and then zoomed way in and out, and it's actually kind of neat. They've added a, a little bit more, more of a what the world is like uh, elements to it. So instead of just being uh, you're the controller and you're controlling the mission. Now it's you're the controller controlling the mission, but then you get to back out afterwards and you've got an entire cis, uh, a city that's that's uh, programmatically, um, procedurally generated. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, a lot, so a lot of games are procedurally generated, it seems like, at the show. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but it gives you more replayability. Yeah, I mean... At the cost of some things not looking, you know, as... as it, it maybe takes away a little bit from the overall art direction of the game, but that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it is what it is. I mean, it's Frozen Synapse. Frozen Synapse wasn't exactly the most graphically intensive game ever. So they've kind of maintained the same graphic intensity, and they've just expanded on what and how and where you can do it. It's kind of almost got like a like civilization meets syndicate kind of feel to it. And then That's the, an uh, interesting combination. Yeah, and then there's the same publisher. They're actually uh, the same publisher dev. They're publishing another game. It's the first game that they're publishing that they're not developing, and it's called Tokyo 42, and it's by the, uh, the Smack is the name of the dev group, but I'm going to dub them now the Smack Brothers because it's actually two brothers who are making the game, and uh, they're they're going to be stuck with it, and they're going to hate me for it. But the Smack Brothers, that's what we're going to make them do it. Smack Brothers? Smack Brothers. Interesting. Tokyo 42 is kind of funny because the, the plot made me laugh. You are an assassin, and you were framed for a murder. It's like, what? I'm sorry, I didn't commit that one. <laughs> uh, that one's too sloppy. I'm a lot cleaner. You know that one happened. That's why. And then, of course, there's an option. It's almost like a... I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny. There's a katana mode where you can run around the katana, and the slashing of the katana is just ridiculous. Hmm. Uh, and you can just murder people if you wanted to. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. This is so funny. Uh, so just... But it, lo it's, it looks like a fun game. It's almost like a... It reminds me of Syndicate to a certain extent. In that kind of uh, mercenary kind of thing a lot of things that reminded me of Syndicate out on the floor. It's interesting. All right, uh, you want to talk about uh, Double Fine's new interesting project? that we Headlander. Head Headlander. Headlander. Not You're Highlander. Head. Not Highlander. Head... Lander, you're ahead, and you land on things like seriously. We, we made it. We're making a, you know, all these things. We're making longer form videos, but to be quick on this one, it's a, a 2D side scroller. It's it's got this really interesting, almost beautiful Art Deco mod like art style, and it's set in space, of course. You are ahead, and uh, you can shoot other characters or other bad guys or whatever. If you hit them in the head, their head will pop off, and you can detach your head and go over and attach it to them. It's, it's going to be used for puzzles because, you know, sometimes you need to go across a, a chasm that you cannot cross with your full person, but you can float your head over to, a, you know, another person and, and attach it to them after you've shot their head off. Um, you you can... Uh, the effects in that game, like the, the, the gun effects and stuff, really pretty. Um, I think that game's going to be quite interesting because just because the, the, the level of puzzles and action that you can complete. Also, it's pretty tense. If you're in a, an area and your, your body's about to die, you can detach your head and fly around, and everyone's shooting at your head while you're flying around the room. So it's, yeah, it's, it's almost ridiculous. 
It, no, it, it is ridiculous. Well, it's called Headlander. It's Headlander. Right. It's nuts. It's double fine. What do you expect? Yeah. You guys are great. Yeah. It's pretty um, tongue-in-cheek. The, the, the voiceovers and the dialogue were like really tongue-in-cheek as well. How, how did you describe it to me? You said the, the, there was like a, there was an I overall like, voice that was talking to you throughout I, the game, and you felt it was... I felt it was Jubal Hershaw. Like, I just... I mean, I heard the voice, but I saw Jubal Hershaw saying that. That's what I was thinking in my head. No one knows what he looks like, but I saw the guy I imagine when I read the book. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I got. After you said that, I'm like, yep, that's him. That's Jubal. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been, it's been pretty crazy. There's there's so many different games that we got to check out, and I we, we could go into all of them here, but we've made whole got, videos about one. them. Hold so. on, I got another one. Oh, wait, you got another one? Wait. Ruiner. Ruiner. That one's actually looking pretty cool. That's coming that out from, looks... uh, is that Devolver? That's from Devolver Digital. I, I forget the actual developer behind the game. Devolver is going to be publishing this. And they said they took some cues from Hotline Miami, but not really. It was, you know, it was just fast-paced, but it's a cyberpunk world that everything is hand-placed, not procedural. And the thing that I'm really looking forward to in this is it kind of reminded me of the style of the old Crusader, no remorse and no regret games, except the controls are much improved. I didn't like the control in the Crusader and, and, and Well, that's that because it was, you know, 1995, 96, yeah. those things came out. But that, those games always weirded me out because it was similar to, like, um, the Resident Evil games where... The up button is the forward button for your character, depending on which direction he's facing. So that always weirded my brain out. Uh, this one wasn't like that. So um, it's also a cyberpunk setting, which is cool. It's always pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. So it has a nice art style. And uh, you're there to ruin lives. I mean, there's oh, a yeah. plot, of course. But oh, yeah. The indie booth this year is the biggest it has ever been. That's a good thing. A very it good is. thing, yeah. I, I was a little let down uh, the last couple times I've been to PAX East because I felt like the indie booth at PAX Prime has just always been like, the cool spot to be, I guess. I don't know the much bigger, much better, but yeah, it's 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 back this year, and it's it's nice. Go check out all of our all, all of our footage. We've got what's that one? This. Talk about that for just a minute. Pro. Okay, so it's not just video games. This one isn't just it. Well, it's it's weird because it is, but it isn't. It made my hurt, head hurt just a lot looking at it. But it's cool. Yeah. Basically, they've taken the entire D20 system that you'd use for playing like D and D, uh, and what was it, 3.5 and 3.5 Pathfinder also is, is compatible, and they're working on Fifth Ed uh, right now, uh, making it. Well, it's compatible with any D20 D20 game, but what they're doing for those games is into the software they're importing all the spell lists, the monsters, and all that sort of thing. So, you know, if you want a kobold or whatever. Uh, you can just be like, okay, grab it. It'll bring up all the stats. You can drop it into your dungeon. It's really a big dungeon. It's it's a dungeon management, but it goes beyond that because it allows you to have a dungeon master that has a giant screen and he can create dungeons and, and levels and areas and there's lots of tiles that he can use to, to build that. And he can see things and he can drag and drop all the characters on there. And then he can send them little secret messages and that sort of thing. And then maybe if another character is there, well, he can have a seat and his view is different, so each player can have their own seat. And it doesn't even have to be local play. I mean, that's the really cool part about it. Is it's all network play, yeah. so you can actually have it play over you know, wide area network. You can play it over over the internet, yeah. and you can you can connect up to these different things. You can have one person playing this or that, or everybody just sitting around on laptops, and you get to it's you get to see the dungeon functionality. They did describe you said one mode of play that they like to do is they've got one of these really big touchscreen monitors, and they just drop it down flat like a table, and then the D, uh, the GM is going to sit in the background. Uh, on, his with, on his laptop with, with functionality and capability of, of manipulating the game while these guys are all playing the game. So he's kind of literally just the overseer. And it was kind of neat. It was kind of nifty. D20 Pro is the name of the, uh, the software. Uh, definitely check it out. And you don't have to have a touch screen, even though they did have several of them. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's kind of neat. I liked it. I thought it was kind of... I, I, I'm really looking forward to, to kind of really delving in because the one thing I asked is, if I came up with my own thing, completely independent, can I build all of it into this game? He goes, oh, yeah. You just have to spend all of the time creating all of the aspects and elements of the game uh, into the you, engine. You can do it. I mean, you can go in and add your monsters and add your uh, variables and add your spells and everything. It, you can, it can be done. So We just got had. <laughs> Mark from MSI. <laughs> Shake my fist at you. Anyway. Uh, cool. So I think that's uh, everything from here. Yeah, I think people expect some news, too. So let's, uh, let's go do some news. No, no, we're not doing anything. I'm too stressed. Right, we, we should land syndicate now we're in Boston. No, you're not getting any news. All right, fine, we'll do some news. I'm just going to mic drop. How about that? Not that thing. That's expensive. If you, uh, I saw a thing on the meme the other day. It said that no one has ever done a mic drop who has purchased a mic before. And these are true words. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I needed that. What? Boston's been good to me. 
Alright, this is going to be the sleaze episode of the tech, y'all. Does y'all go with this environment? Give me this thing. Hmm. I don't even know what this is made out of. I think it's made out of pears. Uh, grape juice. Mm -hmm. Alright, guys. Um, This episode of the tech is... Um, Long overdue. Long, yeah, it's been... We couldn't go a couple of weeks. This is all. This is the best we could do right now. Yeah. Tried to set this up in our room. Didn't work. Tried to set it up at PAX. The uh, problem was internet connectivity. You have to have internet connectivity to do the tech. So yeah. we're in this... Whatever the hell this is. This is... um. They wouldn't let us into a conference room, and they were all whiny about it. So we said, screw it, we're just going to take over your <laughs> lobby area, and we proceeded to rearrange everything, as we normally do. You guys want some news to talk about in the comments? So let's get some news to talk about in the comments. Got it. First off, uh, let's just start off with this, because it's very interesting, and this, it's something they're not really talking about here at PAX. Literally, this just uh, this information Today. just went live, like, I don't know, maybe half an hour ago. Or at least I saw it about half an hour ago. Yeah, so this is on uh, PC Perspective. You were looking at uh, Tweet Town. Basically, the specs have been leaked, probably on purpose, for the AMD Radeon Pro Duo. It's essentially two Fury Xs slapped together. Dual it's actually going to be the, the card. Um, you know, the, the, the Fury Xs run at like 275 watts. This mm. thing's dual GPU. Mm. It's only running 350, which sounds like a lot, but it's two GPUs. It's pretty awesome. And it's got 8 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's, for each CPU, it's 4 gigs per CPU. The CPUs are clocked at a gigahertz apiece. It's got... Four display ports. I mean, it, this thing is ridiculous. It's got almost, it's got it's 1.5 times the performance of the Titan X. So they say, and that's also your games are going to need to support, uh, well, possibly support Crossfire, but I don't know with a lot of the DirectX 12 stuff out there. Um, they, and also having it on one card might help to some of the issues with did you, uh, Crossfire. Did you need Crossfire for 200, the 295X2? I believe that the games with the uh, you know I didn't really play with one of those, but I know that um, a lot of the games that required Crossfire support were kind of weird with it. They just didn't like the two GPUs. We should cut this, because I don't know. I'll cut that. I don't know. So anyway, um, it's just going to be really expensive. That's the main That's the main it's takeaway for me. 1500 bucks. Is that worth 1.5 times the performance of a they're, Titan X? They're not saying this is for your elite gamers or your high-end gamers. This is for your insane people with $1,500 to blow on a dual graphics card. Or dual GPU graphics. AMD stock's been going way up. Uh, they're talking about their, you know... Their secret new stuff that they, they they won't say anything. I went by their booth here at PAX and was like, hey, we're Tech Syndicate. They have no idea. They're like, oh, whatever. Like, you know, Tech Syndicate, we've got millions of hits on videos where we talk about AMD products. They're like, no. They're like, can I get a card? They're like, there's a bird over there. Fire your marketing team, AMD. You know, I mean, you say that. No, I went by and I proceeded to just schmooze them a little. I'm like, hey, you got anything new since CES? And they're like, no. And then why the hell are you here? Oh, they've got the uh, the yeah, Wraith cooler. Actually, the Wraith cooler is kind of yeah, it's kind of cool. It's the new stock cooler that they got. It's really really quiet compared to the old jet engines that they used to put in the uh, in the stock. But they, it's now coming with uh, all the GPUs, not the GPUs, all the CPUs. And I asked them if you can get it separately. They're like, no. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So I don't know. I, I they I mean they're obviously showing off their their stuff here to a lot of the audience that. I mean, they're gaming on it. They don't really know all the technology, so they're going to come and be like, oh, what's that? Oh, oh it's a it. there, there Fury some, Nano. Oh, there, that's There are nice. some new motherboards from MSI and ASRock, which they were showing off. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, they were showing off some of the stuff, but it's really, it's cool. I don't know. I'm not I'm not really dissing them. I just, uh, I, I wish somebody had a business card I could have collected. That would have been nice. All right, this is a, let's, let's get over to some of the more normal stuff. Microsoft and Google are agreeing to end all regulatory complaints, and they're going to try to compete normally instead of doing it in the courtroom, which I think is very interesting. Finally, I, I want to know what's behind this. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, they're, they're they're doing this, but there must be some incentive for Microsoft and Google to stop suing each other. Mostly, you know, a lot of this is Microsoft pursuing Google and saying like, "Hey, we got problems with your Android OS. We got problems with this. We've got all these old patents that we can twist to mean things that you have." I think the uh, you know Washington is uh, is not legal smoke weed. I think uh, somebody from Google high up and somebody from uh, Microsoft high up got in a room. Uh, smoke some ganj, and then proceeded to have a nice long chit chat and be like, "Man, why are we fighting all the time?" And they, they hugged decided it out. they hugged it out, and they decided, mm. "You know what, man? We'll just compete by making better products instead of whining like little babies." Yeah, that's a great idea. Pass the pass the bomb. You know, that's <laughs> that's what I think they did. Um, what I want to know is, is Microsoft still going to be going after Android partners? You know, like um, they were always chasing them around, being like, "Hey, you guys are doing some bad stuff," with and, and so just give us a couple bucks for every Android phone you sell, and we'll call it even. So they, they stopped doing that with some a while back, and then in China, China kind of put their foot down. But um, 
And I want to know how, how much Microsoft is actually going to let up. Are they going to let up completely? That'd be interesting. Uh, they decided to drop the two complaints out of each other. Yeah. Man, this is funny. Yeah. So you right. block ad blockers. Your traffic goes down. If you uh, go to a website and, you know, ad block is, um, it's got one of those things where it's like, oh, we see you're running ad block. Please disable it to continue. Do you disable ad block to continue? No, or you just close it down. You know, you know why that is, in my opinion? The, the websites that do that have pretty nasty ads. Like, after, like, I've done that, like, once. I've gone to a website, and it was like, hey, um, you've got ad block on. Turn it off. And I was like, oh, I really want to read this article. Okay, I'll turn it off. And as soon as I turned it off, I just got slapped in the face with so many ads. I, I Next thing I know, I'm naked, taking a, taking a cold shower, got- trying to figure out what the hell just happened to me. No, you know, yeah, violated I, on the screen. I, I think it is kind of ridiculous because what you'll end up happening is having like eight or nine like picture ads, mm-hmm. and then you'll have a carousel video ad. That even if you tell it to shut up and mute it and stop it, after ten minutes it'll recycle and start. Mm-hmm. And we've had them on here before where we've had it was like, wait, where's that mute noise coming from? We actually have to go in and like disable the code that loads that ad. It's like screw you guys. So I actually have like all fancy numbers and stuff here for the show. Like, look at those. Those that's going down. See that? Hmm. Forbes is the worst. It really is. It is the worst amongst these. Because you, you go to the Forbes, you're like, oh, it's Forbes. Really, does Forbes, as a what they are and how much money they've made over the years, do they really need to... I think they might, really. I mean, uh, I, I think they... print they, is going they, dead or something. Yeah, so. yeah they're, they're, their bounce rate is phenomenal. 27%. Ours is like 45 to 50%, but that's phenomenal bounce rate. Wow. All right, anyway, let's move right along then. Next up on the list, Apple should pay more tax, says Wozniak. Apple has been doing everything they can to avoid tax in the EU and also the USA, using tax havens and all kinds of slippery tactics. I believe Tech Syndicate probably pays more tax than Apple and Facebook combined, and that's ridiculous. That's absurd. And they do pay some tax, but by and large, they're very good at using loopholes. You know, the thing is here is, um, you know, Wozniak saying this, I think, what the hell are we listening to? I think, yeah. I think Wozniak, with, with some of his power, should, lo- should hire a lobbyist to go to Washington and help them rewrite some laws because that's the main problem here is that, that all the people in power have been paid to create these loopholes and these tax havens and the freaking Panama Papers and all these sort of things that just enable major corporations and wealthy people to you know avoid giving their money to the government to help pay for roads and the services that they use to you know like to run their businesses uh, and then like the young you know like the the smaller companies like us get stuck paying their bills. For all the services, and, you that know, it's using. not only Apple that's in this position. I mean, you got Google, Microsoft. I mean, you pretty yeah. much name any big major company, and they they're they're guilty of the this. Thing about and Apple, this just happens to be that Wozniak is like, man, I pay taxes. I I mean, I'm paying my taxes. You guys should pay your. Well, taxes. see, the thing about the thing about Apple is that they always pretend to be such a wholesome, good company. You know, it's like the it's like they're the guy next door who has like a family locked up in their basement, and then they come out and they have ribs with people that are from next door. You know, they're that guy. You know, like they're just and the, the guy, nice the guy. The thing is, the guy next door is Google, and yeah. they've got the, like the other neighbor's family locked up in their basement. We just don't know it yet because they we haven't we haven't uncovered the, uh, the you know the secret wall in the basement. We can't repel evil of this magnitude. No, it's not going to happen. Um, see the thing, and the other thing is, is that well, Google. I still have a problem with any of these companies not paying their fair share, but Google is just like, yeah, there's laws. We just. Are you kidding me? We're totally going to abuse the system. I think that's I think that's the uh, I think that's the difference when I look at Google versus Apple in this aspect. Yeah, that it, Google's just like, yep, we're totally doing that. We'll change the rules and we'll we'll follow you, the rules, but yeah. we'll follow them. Yeah. And Apple's like, we pay all the taxes that we owe, which is actually what Tim Cook said in response to this. Yeah, he, yeah, of course he's, he's like, of course you pay all the taxes you owe. You're equivocating, son but of not a... the ones that you should be owing. Anyway, mm. I just a quick little thing on uh, a lot of people have been talking about. Some of the the new stuff that's been going on with Opera. First off, Opera they, they've got their own ad service they're they're trying to uh, uh, to work with. Or that's the new company that Opera, but this is the, the creator of Opera. But now the regular Opera, uh, they're integrating a VPN into their service. This music's so funky, man. Uh, here's the deal: it's going to be a free VPN, but you need to look at their terms of service. Remember, when something's free and it's not open source. Well, Opera's kind of open source. It's using Chrome now, so if something's free and it's provided to you, and someone's paying a bill somewhere, you're probably the product. And someone even says that down here, I think, in the comments. But just go and look at all the uh, fine print, and uh, I would not trust Opera's VPN as far as I like, can sling a piano. I mean, it's a great idea. 
but that's about the extent of it. I mean, they purchased a Surf Easy VPN just over a year ago, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they're located in Canada. It's one of the five highest countries, just as a point out, you know. I don't know. The whole thing, I think, is... Um, they keep broadband usage logs. That's, you know... I mean, so does Chrome, but they're not trying to well, say that we're going to put a VPN. I mean, the only, yeah, the yeah, only Chrome, reason... Chrome's not this, a VPN. I mean, yeah. this the is only, the whole idea. The only, the only thing that I think the VPN would be useful for is for people who are trying to bypass throttling. But even then, um, I mean, how long before those things get blocked and suddenly your VPN on that software is useless? Because that's, that's, there, there are services that, that proactively go and say, oh, these are known VPN endpoints, and they just block them. Because they're like, no, nah, we don't want to anonymize our traffic, so to speak. Which, in all reality, I don't necessarily uh, like. Um, but sometimes it's really necessary. Like, if you use Tor, you use a known Tor exit node, people abuse the crap out of it, so you block it all. Unfortunately, guys who are abusing it, you know, the reasons that, that you know, things get it blocked like that. Just so you know. All right, let's go through a few um, uh, solar articles. Um, Several. Yeah, I mean this show is so low already that it that didn't work. It's uh yeah I don't even know where you were going with that. So so low oh, low I don't know. <laughs> I don't have no it's point. so low it's on the floor. Anyway, we've got a million I, installations. That's the worst thing I've ever done in my life. We got a million installations across the country, and that's uh that's great. I mean, it so took it, them 40 it, it, years to get here. But, but they say the next million is going to come in the next, um, was it, was it the next two years. Yeah. It's going to so take two years. it took that long to get a million, and the next two years we're going to get two million. So there's that. Uh, moving on to some more stuff here. San Francisco has a new law that's saying that all the new buildings must have solar panels on the roof. That's great because they have power problems anyway. Uh, yep. Or they did at several points, and they probably still do. Yep. Uh, and, uh, this one I think is really interesting. They said the amount of land required to run American. America, like all of America, on solar power is 0.6% of the country, which That's I don't wonder if that includes Alaska. 11,200,000 acres. Um, now, imagine it does. I mean, but the problem is, is that people, you know, when, when you say that, it's kind of a misleading thing. You can't just put one giant solar array in the middle of Arizona I mean, you could. or Nevada, but you, it would be it difficult to... It wouldn't, you, your transportation of power out of that would just, it would get... Entropy. Look it up. It's You're gonna have to have lots and lots of solar farms and lots and lots of areas, and then we're also it's gonna go beyond the 11 million 200 thousand acres because then you're going to have to have service roads and you're going to have to have you know just stuff around the installations. It won't just be there. You need that much surface area just for solar panels. Having said that, if we start putting solar panels on the roofs of all you know all the different buildings and that sort of thing, it'd probably be pretty easy to get to. A I'm, I'm gonna say the uh, the the mass. Acres. Everybody gonna hate us words. Yeah, we, you know, solar roadways. Just saying. <laughs> Wait, there's People a guy. Like, there's, wait, no, no. There's a there's a very condescending guy who disproves this by writing on the math on the chalkboard with lots of math. Now, you know what? It was really interesting. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Uh, I just I think that all of the solar stuff in a forward thinking manner, being that kind of level that level of negative, and not providing a alternate solution other than just put it on your house. It's like let's let's really kind of spell and figure out what and where and how. I mean, because in all reality, it's like, oh, you know, on the roads, people, cars are going to drive on parking lots. Cars are going to park there. You put it on your house, clouds are going to roll in. There's nighttime. Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, co- nuclear plants run all night long. I'm just saying. You know, yeah. Coal plants, same dude, thing. It, it, Natural if, gas. The dude, you know, I would like for him to make another video where he presents a very interesting alternative because if he's smart enough to go through and criticize it on that level, he should be smart enough to come up with some sort of an alternative. Um, yeah, it's, that would proactively it's, promote this level of solar uh, renewable energy sources. I mean, considering if we could actually get the space, and it wasn't displacing a whole group of people again, and it wasn't uh, destroying large quantities of you know eco habitat related stuff. Um, I mean, that's unfortunate. That's the side effect, you know. It's yeah. Like, no matter where we put this. Man, this is going to be really rough for Republicans because. You know, they they enjoy destroying uh, like like habitats, like the screw the freaking uh, you know gray owl and man, if we can go. I, I and, wouldn't I wouldn't classify that Republicans. I just think people who are all. Oh about no, I'm going this. there. It's the it's the damned Republicans. I'm not. I'm an independent. So I, I the damn Democrats are just sitting by going, oh stop it, stop it, no, stop doing this. And the Republicans are like, yeah. We get a we get a drive a truck into the run over the rabbits. And the Democrats are going, no, stop. And I'm having a sandwich. Anyway, um, I forgot where I was going with this, but it was going to be awesome. Oh yeah, so it's it's going to be a 
it's going to be funny for them because they hate renewable energy because it's just like, man, let's drink some more cold juice and, and whatnot. So, but they love destroying ecosystems, especially if they can kill a few endangered rabbits or something. And these will, these might do that. So what, what are they going to do? You can't have it both ways. You can't have some nice, uh, you know, renewable energy and it's just, what are they going to do? Well, someone's going to make the panels. Someone's got to have the, uh, the, you know, the fuel powered vehicles to go out there and smash everything. Mm. Ultimately, the, the thing is, is that once we figure out exactly when, well, once we figure out where we can put all of this and it's useful. Because again, the other thing about putting it on a house is that you have to put it in the right spot. If your house is facing the wrong direction, it's almost useless. Uh, if you've got like a, like a, just a vertical one, one side in the house where the roof is only on one side and it's the north side, you're kind of mm. screwed unless you're way up north. And even then, it's just, anyway. It, it's, I, there's a lot that goes into it, and I think that uh, on the on the solar side of things, I think we're on the right track. I really hope we offend someone with this episode. I think we're going to now. Listen, if you're not offended, you can kiss my black ass. Move right along, then. So, Hillary, um, the Super PAC is spending a million dollars to correct commenters on Reddit and Facebook. Well, at least someone's got a job to go on Reddit and Facebook. I mean... Kudos to all of you guys. I mean, is this would these be got would these? I wonder what the the job title for these these people would be. Would they be social media correctors or social media advocates? I mean, what would you actually title the job title for somebody whose job it is to go into Reddit and Facebook and just correct people about these things and that stuff? Barrier breakers, breakers. I think. I don't know. I mean, that's that's the 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 project is called the barrier breakers. I don't know. I I think it's a really great usage of funding to you know. Hit the social media where it hurts, you know. Right, right in the Reddit. Right in the punch you right in your Reddit. Right in the Reddit, mm -hmm. and maybe in your Facebook too. Backhand somebody in your Facebook, punch you in the Reddit, and then I'll get all up in your space. But don't get in my space. <laughs> uh, uh, that's not that good. Yeah, who gives a shit? So NASA has successfully tested a, uh, a drone traffic control system. I'd say it's similar to like FAA's air traffic control, where you just kind of monitor all the planes mm -hmm. and everything. And this would be kind of interesting because I think uh, you're going to get companies like Amazon are trying to do like their drone, uh, their drone delivery system, or uh, one of those other fancy companies that are trying to do this kind of crap. Uh, and suddenly, you'll have the ability for this to work. I wonder if it's, you know introducing this is going to increase the regulations for people who are hobbyists who want to be able to fly their drone around and be like. No, no, no. Um, I mean, I, I don't I mean, think still so. You have hobbyists who like fly around helicopters and airplanes, I guess. You know? I mean, that all happens. I mean, what I think is really interesting is that the places that they used to test this out was Alaska, North Dakota, Nevada, New York, Virginia, and Maryland. And I, other than, no, actually, all of those have a lot of empty space that they could play around with this, thing, especially Alaska. I think Alaska's got more empty space than any of the other states combined. I wonder where they did it in Alaska. I'm pretty curious. All right, so uh, Lisa Nip, she's a doctoral candidate at the MIT Media Lab, uh, had a recent TED Talk, and she's talking about, I, I guess, just the future of every, everything through genetic manipulation, because we're getting, we're going to get way better at it, and we may be able to engineer better versions of ourselves Great. in the we're future. Gonna, it was it the tardigrade? Is that what those things are called? We're yeah. going to start splicing. We're gonna I be... say splicing. That's the wrong term. We're going to do use... Tardigrade uh, genetics and human genetics, we put them together, and suddenly they're going to be really large, multi armed things that can survive in everything. I'll be your water bear. Water bear or water bearer? Water bear. You know, like an Aquarius. Um, I don't think we're going to go that extreme yet. Right now, what she's talking about is like, you know, when we go out in outer space for a little while, muscles atrophied, bones start, bones and density goes to shit, um, and life is really rough because you know different gravitational uh, fields uh, also in some places just the amount of radiation like if we, if we go to mars and walk around even with suits and stuff on we're going to be absorbing way more radiation now there are you know organisms on the earth that can handle way more radiation there are organisms on the earth that, that we can probably pull from and then use what we learn from that to engineer better versions of ourselves that were that will not degrade in space so at what point do we just call them mutants, and we can stop calling them humans? Hmm. I think we'll call it, well, I don't know. These genetic experiments. There'll be a, I wonder, if I wonder how many are going to go wrong. There's always... Know, Dr. The, Moreau. Yeah. 
There's always the, the moral question for these sort of things what as moral well. Question? well. We'll start off with plants. So I got it. Oh, you know what? I got it. I got it. So if we want to do this the natural way, we're just going to send a whole bunch of people up into space and we're going to have them breed like bunny rabbits. Yeah, that's going to take thousands of years. We ain't got that kind Not of time. Not necessarily. Rapid, you know, forced evolution and rapid succession. I mean, we, we, we've completely modified a lot of dog species in the last hundred years. I mean, German Shepherds used to be a lot smaller. If I remember correctly, they were a lot bigger. I'm impatient. Uh, Make it happen now. Also, like, she has some interesting stuff. Like right now, if we wanted to, uh, you know, terraform Mars and, and, and plant... Uh, tr trees and, and, and grass and that sort of thing on there. Well, it's going to die because it's negative 65 Fahrenheit uh, up there, so it's not going to work. But we can splice in some stuff that has like some like fish, for instance. I can survive in very very cold and cold uh, environments. We can splice some genes in from that and possibly give them antifreeze like capabilities so that they can actually survive on Mars with the weird, ridiculous soil that's almost like volcanic ash, and um, they can survive in that and not need a dome. They could just work that might so be how much water do we have to send to mars before we know like start rerouting comets let them crash on mars yeah we're gonna go out there we're gonna set you know like get out into space grab a comet and be like go hit that thing sure otherwise we're gonna be taking all the water from earth and setting it to mars so what's gonna happen to earth we're gonna wait for another comet to hit us put some more water in the atmosphere just saying uh, it's kind of neat. Quick mention. This is really neat. Oh, I think mainly to me and, and maybe you, because we were there. We're like, oh my gosh, we we're totally there. Mm -hmm. I wonder if any of this data was happening while we were there, and if somehow our presence affected this. I doubt it. I've been drinking too much wine. Yeah, we're not that important. So they're releasing three terabytes effect, of what's that? Butterfly effect. I could have walked in the right spot and did some kind of weirdness to the. Not really. I'm. The so moth effect is all that the, works. The guy on that me. tours around and in, uh, in, uh, in, in CERN, he's just face palming right now. He's like, oh, God, guys, never all this stop. All this data is because we were there. Yep, 300 terabytes of Logan and Kane, Hadron Collider. They didn't let me down in the pipe. They said it would die. I said, You I'm and that jacket in the comments after that thing you just said, 300 terabytes of us. It's terabytes. Yeah. It's terrible. Then it bites. Um,. So anyway, you can uh, go and play with this data if you That's fancy cool. yourself. It, it's just an interesting way to like crowdsource some of the research here. Uh, i got a couple more things to talk about. This is whatever. Let's talk about Doom. I forgot about that article. I didn't bring that one up. That's okay. This is kind of neat, though. I, I, just, I don't know why this is neat, but they, you know, it's, it's a Titanic sinking. Two hours and 40 minutes. You can sit back and watch a simulation of the Titanic sinking over two hours and 40 minutes. And the internet's kind of crap. This here, would but... probably be a better to watch this than to, uh, you know to watch the actual movie. Yeah, this is more riveting than the movie and has better performances as well. well. Look at that thing; it's just going down. Don't let go of the ropes, Jack. Don't let go of the ropes. Not too long ago, uh, it was a deep mind. Google's deep mind beat the Go champion mm -hmm. of of the world. You so, made a big deal out of that. Because it was uh, well, no, artificial, it was artificial uh, intelligence. It was actually the machine learned and beat him. Yeah, and what's really interesting about that was not too long ago when, when um, Watson beat the guy at chess, mm -hmm. they were like, "Oh yeah, when we can beat Go, we're gonna have a problem because that's so much more complicated than 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 chess." And I think the the way that they programmed DeepMind to play Go was much more interesting because it just studied all of these games and it studied play styles and it studied. And, you know, the actual program was making decisions based on, like, intelligent context of where am I in this game right now, what could be done, and what could the potential outcomes be. And we think about all of those the same way that uh, Major Go players describe it. So the next step is that these guys at the, uh, the Computational Intelligence and Games Conference decided we're going to make a competition and see if you guys can write an AI that can beat Doom. But not beat Doom in the beat, same beat, way... You, it's a multiplayer of bots, essentially. Yeah, but not in the same way that, uh, you know, right now, if you were to write a program to, to, to play Doom, you'd use the game data itself to, to play the game, you know, to for the for the bot to understand where things are going. It would have yeah, the maps. Yeah, it has the maps and the, the player, other player information, the ammo drops and that sort of thing, and it knows where those are. So it can... It just basically has to adjust its difficulty based upon those things and try to give you a good fight. But it's... It's a computer. It's, it's an AI opponent. It, it's it's not as much fun to play. It doesn't feel organic. You can obviously tell it's, it's an AI every time. Yeah. So what this 
concept was is that they were going to create uh, AIs based on only getting the uh, video frame buffer information. So it's basically and then, seeing whatever you see. Yeah, and then getting uh, getting mouse controls or keyboard controls to to play the game in the same way that you would. So it has an input, which is those, and then the the or I'm sorry, the input to the AI is just visual information, and then the output back to the program is the same control set that you would use. I think the implications for this, if they're able to make it work, are pretty big. Number one, the bots in uh, multiplayer games are going to become instantly way more fun to fight. But beyond that, I'm thinking like you know, future games, if they can create systems where in other newer modern games or whatever that come out, the enemies, instead of just relying upon the computer data that's already in the machine and the maps and that sort of thing, if those enemies are able to simulate other players where they're just getting their frame buffer information, it'll be much easier to sneak up on them. It'll be much more dynamic anyway. You won't have to worry about the cone of vision and stuff. It'll be more organic, um, you know, just based upon their, whatever they're receiving visually. And, uh, and maybe also, maybe they, maybe they, we can get the audio feed for them or something. That would be kind of interesting. I think, I think that would be step two. I think it could be a pretty uh, big step deal three the, is, the um, Yes, and then step three is a Singularity and Skynet. I'm sorry, but I, every single time we think about these things, the more I look at this, I'm going, we're teaching computers how to learn and teach themselves based on human experience. And at what point is it just going to do something else? Like at what, you know, I always kind of laugh. Whenever because, we tell it to. You, and, you know, yeah. they, they only do what we tell them to do, right? You know, and, and I've, I've, I've looked at and I've, I've done a lot of research into it. It's like when we talk about a, a robotic mind and the artificial intelligence and the way it processes information, it's very different from us. And, well, I always joke about the whole Skynet thing in the context of, oh, these things kind of have this human kind of behavior. But with these kinds of uh, artificial intelligence programs and the way that we're trying to get these things to operate, they are trying to operate like a human. I mean, hopefully we'll have data uh, as opposed to, you know, Terminator. Just saying. I don't know. Maybe both be fun in different ways. Sure. One's going to try to kill you, and the other one's going to try to beat you. Cool. Anyway. I'm fine with it. Whichever this is going to be cool. I, I'm really looking forward to beating or getting my ass beat by these uh, these AIs. So we'll see how that uh, turns out. It'd be cool to go and actually cover that event. I'm not sure where it is. And I think we... Uh, well, we missed to... it this year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, let us know what you think in the comments. Actually, I don't. don't. I don't really care. Wait until next week. Yeah. When we're actually somewhere in the office or something like that. We kind of have, we kind of have an office now. Signed, signed a contract day before uh, Land Syndicate. So that's cool. Uh, Land Syndicate video, we'll try to get that out in uh, next week. I know you guys have already seen some vlogs from all the other channels. Uh, ours is good. We'll try to make more of a longer documentary just on the entire experience, what we went through. Let's put this together and then uh, you know, just cover some of the event. So that'll be at least a few more days. Special thanks to Corsair. Check out their booth coverage for the new Cherry MX exclusive Extremely Fast Switch. They've upgraded one of their old mice with a very nice infrared sensor, and we've got some pretty interesting technology going on with the Lua scripting on some of their keyboards. So check out the booth coverage, and also, if you're at PAX, stop by and see us at their booth Sunday, 2 o'clock. Be there or be a dodecahedron.